Hello, everyone. Uh, fantastic. Um, first day of the semester and uh, first day of social psychology. I'm very excited to uh, welcome you not only into my uh, bedroom slash living room here in uh, uh, South London, but also to social psychology. Um, we will have the uh, pleasure to um, yeah, to kind of learn about social psychology. I have the pleasure to teach you social psychology in the next uh, 10 weeks, over the next 11 weeks, actually. Um, and today I want to give you a little bit of a, an intuition, a feeling about what social psychology is and uh, why it's hopefully interesting to you. Some of you might have had already a little bit social psychology during your A-levels. That's often uh, good, sometimes harmful. I think sometimes some of the stuff that is taught in social psychology in the A-levels is not quite correct, but we will go through all of this. Um, I can see uh, two people uh, already in the video that I will introduce later on. This is Yasmin and uh, Constanza Connie, uh, who will be teaching your uh, seminars on Friday. Um, so uh, I will introduce them both later, but they're here too, and it's nice to see them. Uh, and I think if you want to have a look at them, you can see them if you click on the uh, uh, participants. So yes, welcome everyone. What do we want to do? I want to kind of start by giving you a little bit of an intuition about what social psychology is about and also while doing so giving you a feel of what we are trying to achieve in this um, uh, in this module what I want you to be able to to do at the end and that will also relate to your coursework and in the second part of this I will do something I don't really like but I think we should do in the first uh, in our first session talk a little bit about the structure about coursework about where to find things and uh, reading lists. And I will also pause a moment and introduce uh, Connie and Yasmin so that when we are starting into it, we're all on the same page and you know where to find and what will happen, where to find what and what will happen uh, at what time. Okay, so let me give you, start by giving you a little bit an introduction of um, the uh, uh, topic of social psychology. I mean, it is a tradition that um, uh, there's in the first session there's an introduction. Often this is done by kind of using historical things and a lot of definitions. I, as a student, always disliked introductory sessions. I always thought they were really boring. I always thought, like, is it really relevant for me to know what was the first social psychological experiment about 115 years ago and so forth. So I wanted to do it a little bit differently to just give you more an intuition rather than kind of like a definition. Um, but we also will do a little bit of sciencey stuff later on. Okay. Um, I want to start with something a little bit unusual. So last year in March, um, I think if you can remember for me often uh, these days with lockdown and pandemic, it's a little bit tri tricky to remember what was happening when, but last March, um, suddenly in the beginning of March, I was walking my dog and what I was seeing is like, oh, there were all these posters popping up all around. The, and there was like these posters were advertising that, okay, um, can I just check? Sorry, it's like, okay. All right, so there's, I think, sorry, can everyone hear me? I have one message in the chat that, um, yes, okay, good. <laughs> okay, so sorry, whoever can't hear me, I think it's like, okay, this is good. I think like if you can't hear me, uh, it would be great if you let me know. Then uh, not that I just talk here for like <laughs> an hour and then at the end, it's like, ah, oh, I couldn't hear you. Okay, fantastic. Thanks everyone for letting me know. So um, there was like all these posters popping up and these posters where I think some of you might uh, recognize it was for uh, a woman, a young woman, Sarah Everhart. She went missing at the 3rd of March and the night of 3rd of March. And it was kind of like unusual uh, because it immediately captured somehow the attention of my neighborhood here, the attention of South London, but also kind of national attention. It was like uh, a person went missing, but somehow this really ignited something in people. This re really resonated with people. And probably you will have heard of it, even though at the same time, and we come back to this, um, similar things happened here, uh, not only in England, not only in London, but also in South London. So what was it about this case? I don't know if you remember what actually happened. I don't want to turn this into a, like a crime podcast or anything like that. I will leave the gruesome details out because I'm also not that interested in them here. Um, but um, 
Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, I always get distracted by the chat. But um, here's a, a short summary of what happened to Sarah Everhart, right? Um, she basically, I think on the 3rd of March, she went missing. Then about seven days later, her remains were found in Kent. Um, and um, so she was killed, and it turned out that she was abducted and killed by this man here on the right, Wayne Cousins. Um, he was a police officer at that time. He basically uh, uh, stopped by when she was walking home home uh, during the night from a friend to the house of her boyfriend and he stopped her and said she had broken COVID rules and then uh, arrested her and put her in a car and then um, the rest is uh, yeah uh, uh, ended up killing her at the end um, so somehow this kind of like case of this uh, abduction and murder really resonated with a lot of people here in uh, uh, South London. And I want to kind of use this case to illustrate what the things are we, that we are interested in when we study social psychology, what the phenomena are that we are interested in. Yes, I mean, at the heart of the heart, this is a case about um, uh, 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 like a crime, a pro-social and anti-social behavior, and we come back to that. But what is it? Why did this capture so much attention? If you kind of see uh, what happened thereafter, there were uh, virgils everywhere, not only in the UK, but also worldwide. Um, you can see this. This is uh, from uh, pictures around, taken from thinking of Sarah Everhart around the UK. So what is it about her that really captured our attention? Um, this is just to illustrate this an art article from the New York Times on a Bottom on the top is an article from uh, 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 South Africa. It's not just that the UK, it's not unique to the UK, that this murder in South London really captured worldwide attention. People were uh, uh, interested, they followed it, they were outraged. And so um, I think it was a really interesting case to look at it. I was like really puzzled at the beginning why there was such a widespread interest in this case. And so I took this and tried to use my social psychological understanding to better say like, okay, what is going on? What is going on with all these different responses? And I want to kind of highlight that a little bit when walking through the next slides. Um, so one thing that's kind of interesting is like it starts, and we will end with that, is a little bit like, okay, we'll talk about a different case about where suddenly people became really interested in Syrian refugees, right? It's very similar to there were uh, Syrian refugees, the situation didn't really change, but there was this one boy that really captured the attention and people started to wanted to help Syrian refugees all over the world. Um, uh, they wanted to help all over the, uh, the world and uh, they start to Google it, donations come in. So there's something about situations where a person, a specific person really captured our attention and really grabs it and wants us to help, right? And so we will talk about in the last session actually about pro-social behavior and kind of looking at who are the people we are interested in helping and who are the people we are not interested in helping. We will also talk about something that was discussed kind of on a more philosophical era, uh, uh, level where people are thinking, about, okay, um, what is it that drives people to commit such heinous crimes, right? Uh, uh, abducting somebody, murdering somebody out of that. Is it something within us that you and I, that we are kind of selfish, immoral uh, uh, people, that the human nature is really not kind, as it is suggested here on the right, but a more like Lord of the Flies, where if we are not regulated by some kind of rules and norms, then things go astray and we kind of end up cheating and murdering each other. Or is it the opposite? Is it actually that what leads us astray is more society, is more the norms, and if we are left alone by these, then, as suggested by the book on the right, then we will be fine. So what is it in our social nature um, that makes us uh, either good or bad. And we will talk about this in our last lecture when we talk about pro-social and anti-social behaviors, okay? Um, but coming a little bit back to this case, there's a really, there's a lot of really interesting aspects happening. One of the things that happened is that he and Club and Common, a kind of point uh, behind me, because this is basically a, a park that's 15 minutes from me. There was a Virgil where they were thinking, women com um, uh, 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 memorized or uh, were thinking of uh, um, the Sarah and trying to um, 
let me just close this, uh, were thinking of it. And so there was a, a, a large gathering and the police intervened and got really uh, uh, violent, right? The police were guys going against these women who were just uh, kind of uh, uh, thinking and having a memorial for Sarah Everhart. Why did this happen? And one of the women said something really interesting. She said like, well, these are police officers and they're used to that we obey them. And if the woman did not obey, then they got outraged and that really um, started the violence. Another aspect, so there's an aspect of obedience. And we will talk about this in, uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure which numbers is, but one in our lectures. The other aspect, which is really interesting is that obviously the murder of Sarah Everhart was a police officer. He used his authority to do something that probably without his authority, he could not have done, right? He basically uh, got a, a young woman at night in her in his car, right? And he used his authority. And so there is something where uh, people and investigators said like, oh, this person should never had the chance to get access to a uniform, suggesting there's something special about uniform and obedience. And we will talk about this when we talk about uh, obedience and social influence. There's something else that really goes on here where people are like, oh, it's maybe not just having a uniform, but there seems to be a culture, a norm of misogyny within the uh, Metropolitan Police Department, within the police department here in London. Maybe there's something fundamentally wrong and more and more was unveiled about uh, what's a misogynist and sexist WhatsApp groups that Wayne uh, Cousin was part of and so forth. Okay, um, so there seems to be two kind of elements that people were really interesting. What are the norms that drive uh, behavior within the social police form? And something we are interested as social psychologists, what does it mean if just the same person has the authority and ask you to obey or not? What does that do to our mind? And we will talk about this when we talk about social influence in our ninth lecture. Um, Another really interesting aspect of this is that what surprised me as well the half there is like that there was this really kind of uh, man versus woman feeling, uh, man versus women feeling in um, the aftermath of Sarah Everhart's murder. Um, so there was something where people said like, oh, we should reclaim the street. It's like here you see uh, Caitlin Moran, she initiated this idea of reclaiming the streets that basically she said, well, what we women experience is some kind of curfew. People said like, oh, you should shouldn't go out at night. This is too dangerous uh, uh, for you. Um, but we want to reclaim the street and maybe men Maybe men should have a curfew. Maybe men shouldn't be allowed to go outside. And then we women would be um, uh, uh, kind of, yeah, we would be uh, uh, safe and would not be, uh, wouldn't have to fear that. So why don't we turn it around? Why don't we give men uh, a curfew? Um, here's a really interesting tweet by, uh, uh, like a tweet that went viral at that time by Jamila Jamil. And she said, it is true that not all men harm women, right? But do all men work to make sure their fellow men do not harm women? Do they interrupt troubling language and behaviors and others? Do they have conversations about women's safety consent with their sons? Are all men interested in our safety? So here you can reference two things. So some people, it's like people would, uh, men like me would react, uh, I didn't, but other like men um, would say, okay, hey, it's not all men. Like, don't paint us all like that, right? There's like, we are not all, this is a really rare case. And they would point out that uh, actually more men than women are killed by strangers, much more men are killed in general uh, than women, that it's much more dangerous to be a man outside than a woman at night, right? Um, and so there was this back and forth. The key interesting thing I think that I wanna highlight here as a social psychologist is that basically what people mainly did is like, they sorted people into groups. It's men versus women. and you you can agree with this or not, but it's interesting that me as a man, I suddenly had to defend myself. It's like, well, what am I doing for women's safety, right? Um, and so uh, this is something that's really fundamental to social psychology, that's really fundamental to uh, psychology in general, and that is group behavior. And we will look at group behavior and, uh, in general, what it does to our mind, how we sort this word and uh, us versus them, and how this impacts in uh, our seventh lecture. There's also something that's very specific about this case, which was actually my first reaction, because I live in South London. South London is a, uh, a place where, unfortunately, crime happens, murder happens. And I think there was a, a very similar case, actually, that was in, in Southeast London, but uh, of Sabina Nessa. Uh, she was also murdered. And somehow this didn't really spark any interest in the world. Uh, it didn't seem like in the UK, people didn't care as much about her as the kid about, uh, cared about Sarah. I have here uh, 
on a, uh, underneath the picture of Sarah Everhart, I have a picture of Tash. Tash was actually killed at the same time in South London, not this exactly the same time, but the same day in South London, right? And somehow um, this is something that didn't spark any interest or outrage uh, uh, across the world or across the UK. And I think there's rightfully so people said like, well, maybe there's also something racist here about it, that we care about some people and we do not care about other people. And if it's like a white woman that is injured, oh, then it's like, oh my God, or murdered. Uh, uh, I have to say, then this is something we really should care about. But if it's a non-white woman, we shouldn't care about, right? So we will talk about this when we talk about racism and when we talk about stereotypes and prejudice to kind of better understand how this influence uh, our social behavior and how this influences our psychology. And this is like one of the key areas of uh, interest and in investigation, uh, stereotypes, uh, prejudice and racism within social uh, psychology and will give it its due time. And racism is often thought kind of like as a, um, like as a, a specific interesting case of attitudes right it's a specific and attitudes we as social psychologists uh think about like i see you i see an object and i immediately automatically evaluate it i put it in good bad and there with this uh, a certain set of beliefs of uh, behavioral tendencies is activated Okay, and so the idea here was often that, oh, how can we change this behavior? What we have to change is men's attitudes towards violence against women. And there are like two really interesting things that are uh, uh, impacted in here. So one was kind of, the, or that implied in here. One is that attitudes drive our behavior. And in the fifth lecture, we will look at attitudes, what attitudes are, and kind of look at how do they actually attitudes um, uh, 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 relate to behavior? Is this actually true that a certain attitude can change it? One thing that um, captured a lot of interest, not just in this case, but especially when we talk about racism, is the idea that we have these kind of unconscious attitudes, things that we are not aware of, right? It's often called this unconscious bias, which is an, an not a good term, and I'll show you why this is not a good term, but you will learn if the, do you and I have some kind of unconscious attitudes towards objects that then drive our behaviors, right? There's often kind of like an unconscious bias training or bias training that we try to do in order to change this behavior. So we will look at this in our fifth lecture when we talk about attitudes and when we kind of look about it, uh, talk about the link between attitudes and behavior, but also talk about these two different types, these more conscious and these less conscious types of attitudes. Um, with the why social psychology is so interested in attitudes is because we believe it is a driver of behavior. And we also believe like maybe this is our way to kind of um, change behavior behavior, right? And here in this case, it's like, okay, it's, uh, it's like a safety app that monitors where a woman is, is not a good way of uh, changing this behavior. What we have to change is people's attitudes, right? We just connect it to it. And often the idea is, I think, a misled idea is that, oh, what we have to do is we have to educate people, right? And I think one of the uh, strong beliefs that social psychology has uh, developed over the last 20 to 30 years is that education is not a very good um, way of changing people's behavior, but there are other ways to change people's attitudes and behaviors. And this is what we look at in, the eighth, um, in our eighth lecture when we talk about persuasion. Okay, how can I change your attitude? How can you change my attitude? What is needed to change a group's attitude over something or not? Okay. Um, and then, okay, so by now we are kind of like on a bigger, we, had, uh, we talked a lot about attitudes and we kind of trying to understand uh, different types of attitudes such as racism and stereotypes. We kind of wondered, okay, how do attitudes li link to behavior and how can we change them? Another aspect which we become, uh, get to pretty soon is like, how do we explain the behavior of others, right? Um, here you can see there was a lot of outrage because um, people were basically like police uh, officers and people in official positions were asked, how do you explain that? How can that happen, right? And it seems like what they immediately did is kind of like having a self-defensive um, uh, a way of explaining these things. They're saying like, oh, it's not the police fault. Women should uh, take more care of themselves, right? And I think women, uh, very rightfully so, were like immediately outraged. It's like, stop blaming us, right? You're not doing your job. But there seems to be something where the way we explain um, the behavior of others, it's not so much whether it's true or not, but there's a certain 
pattern where I think if I see you doing something, I explain it one way. And if I do that, I explain it another way. Okay. And we would talk about social explanation and how we attribute causes to the behavior of others is one of the key areas of social psychology in week four. And then you can better understand, okay, why do you might be inclined to be uh, uh, explain your behavior in a certain way and other people's behavior in a different way and how that impacts the feelings you have and your motivation and so forth. Um, in the third lecture, we would talk about person perception. Okay, so let's just push everything to the side. Oh, like it's it just imagine that you don't know anything about Sarah, you don't know anything about um, uh, where this crime took place, you don't know anything about Wayne on the right, Wayne Cousins, the murderer, and you just look at their faces, right? Uh, I think for us, it seems like, at least for me, most people feel uh, like that too. The moment they hear about such a heinous crime, we want to see the face. We want to see of the face of the uh, 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 the perpetrator we want to look into his face and then it's like this as if we can kind of um interfere anything kind of uh, uh came to some kind of conclusions about the psychological mind of that person by looking at their face so i mean in some sense you say okay what happens i mean we all judge the book by its cover right you look at me and you have a certain first impressions and this is inevitable and we will talk about the inevitability of these first impressions and why we have first impressions of people uh, uh like what goes through our mind when we see another person and which factors influence that, right? We will also talk about if you can actually see something in Wayne's face that might help you to understand whether he's trustworthy or not, or whether this is not something that uh, science supports. Um, so person perception, how we perceive others will be our uh, third topic. Now, one thing <laughs> that's kind of weird in some ways and unexpected is, how much time social psychology spends thinking about self and identity okay and we will start with self and identity too and it was like what does that have to do with all the things you just discussed right what has the like how we think about ourselves our protective mechanisms uh, our motivations uh, our self-esteem our self-worth in which group we put each other uh, put ourselves to do with any of these phenomena but when you think a little bit about it, you will easily recognize that any of these phenomena is determined and kind of heavily influenced by who you think you are, um, whether you think you're, uh, you're self, like you identify as a woman or as a man, right? Or maybe you're something in between or something different, right? This will immediately impact all your reactions to it. It will impact how you think about your ethnicity, how you think about uh, uh, like, uh, uh, yeah, your self-worth, how you think about uh, if you can protect yourself in these situations. All of these phenomena that I just laid out to you are all strongly and heavily influenced by yourself, your sense of self and identity. Not only is the sense of self and identity formed by the people around us, but then it also gives us the lens through which we see the world. And in order to kind of understand that, in order to kind of make sense about, uh, for instance, how we explain other people or how we perceive other, pe uh, how we explain other people's behavior or how we perceive other people, we have to understand what are the motivations of the self that drives us. And we will start with that in uh, the next week, trying to better understand what makes um, the, our, what makes up our sense of self and identity. So if you kind of look at the things that I uh, just mentioned, we talk about pro-social and anti-social behavior, we talk about social influence, group behavior, racism, attitudes, persuasion, social explanation, person perception and self and identity, and you kind of order them, then you see this is our syllabus. This is what we are going to talk about in uh, the next 11 uh, weeks. Um, obviously today we start as well. Oh, one thing I want to say, this is not, <laughs> I, my wife is like, oh, just make sure that they don't think that uh, when I, we talked about this, like, oh, I wanna use the Sarah Everhart case um, in order to introduce the topic of social psychology. She's like, just make sure that the, the, it's clear that this is not 
uh, a module about this case, right? And it's not. Um, I could have picked something else. I was a little bit bored about thinking about anti-mask and anti-vaccination processes, a protest or this behavior, but you can easily use all of these and apply to understand why some people might feel that wearing a mask is something that uh, runs counter to their identity and while other feel kind of almost morally offended if you do not wear a mask, right? You can apply all of these things and explain this behavior as well. You can also think about something like the party gate. Why are people so interested in the party gate, right? What does that have to do? Uh, uh, why is it just like somewhat like whether they had a party or not a year ago, or I don't know when it was like half a year ago, I can't remember, sorry. Uh, I should have been better with the dates. Um, but why is this event that really captivates the uh, attention maybe much more than uh, the war that might break out between Ukraine and Russia at the moment, right? People are really obsessed with that. Why is it that and not that? And I could use all of these things, try to explain that to you. But I also want to make sure that it's not just about society. Social psychology is also about you and me. It's about understanding our own behaviors, understanding who we are and why we act. So if you're purely interested in trying to get a better understanding of who, who you are and how the sense of self and identity and others around you impact your own behavior, then you're also at the right spot because this is also really social psychology. It is really concerned about understanding yourself better. So for instance, I could have used procrastination the biggest problem that we uh, uh, have, like students face about 80% of students, uh, uh, according to surveys, say that they suffer from procrastination. And they can use these processes on some of them and explain procrastination. And we will do this actually next week when we talk about self and identity. I could also talk about like, oh, there's some students who graduate and some students who are not graduating. And you can see how this uh, it kind of fits into the groups they are, how they perceive themselves, their sense of identity, how they explain things, etc. So I could and how could we change that? All of this I could have illustrated with that. I thought maybe Sarah Everhart is a little bit more interesting. But this is just to say that what I'm trying to do is I want to kind of at the end of this module, I want you to be able to kind of see the world a little bit like I see the world through the lens of social psychology. And it's like, oh, here's something that I'm interested in. I wonder what social psychology has to say about this. Um, so because this is my interest, this also links to our coursework, right? Um, so in your coursework, what you're asked to do is I will present you a case and you have to write basically something similar as I presented about Sarah Everhart about this case, right? You need to put yourself here. This is from the description on uh, in uh, the uh, coursework. Um, you, you need to put yourself in a situation where you, as someone who knows a lot about social psychology, have been asked by the head of an organization to prepare a 2,000 word report to, uh, on a social psychology research relevant to a particular problem you're trying to solve. Okay, um, so it could be something like anti mass protests. It could be something like party gate. Here's an example from last year. I always kind of like make it a little like trying to make it a little bit current, but also uh, not too current or not too like uh, specifically tied to a, a certain place. So here you have one that's like um, uh, was one of the problems last year. You've been asked by a leading law firm to be an expert witness in a case where they are defending a police officer who's being tried for committing criminal offenses. The police officer claims that he was instructed by his commanding officer to carry out the actions and was simply following orders, right? This is this idea of obedience, of following somebody with a higher authority. The lawyer tells you that the fact that the officer was following instructions to commit criminal acts wouldn't ordinarily be a defense, but she has heard that there are some psychological studies that show that even good people will do bad things when they're instructed to do, okay? And then I ask you specific questions about this, okay? Um, so this will be kind of like what I did with Sarah, what we will do throughout this, uh, 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 these upcoming 11 weeks um, will be very much uh, uh, centered around applying our understanding to better explain the world through the lens of social psychology. Okay. Um, so if you kind of look at the syllabus from a little bit more like a like timeline, right? Um, we have uh, four more sessions left, then there's the reading week. Before reading week, 
we will have an additional coursework session. I will record, you can either attend it live or I will record it and you can watch it where we talk about uh, the coursework. And at that, at the end of um, week five, that is the week before, at the end of the week before the reading week, we will also release the scenario so you can start working on your coursework then. And then I think the uh, submission deadline is, I think it's roughly a week or two after the semester is over. Um, so this gives you a little bit of an idea of what we're doing and what the structure is when you have to start thinking um, about the coursework. I will come back to coursework in a second, um, uh, or not in a second, in two or three minutes. Well, it's actually not true, more than 10 minutes. Um, and we'll kind of give you a little bit more about details and how we do it and how uh, Yasmin, uh, Connie and I will uh, help you to prepare for your coursework and what we will do to ensure that you have the best chances to uh, succeed. Um, so hold your horses. If you have thereafter questions left about the coursework, in uh, uh, like directly after this uh, lecture, you can join me in the office hour. It's the same link. You just stay on and you can ask me any questions you have about the coursework and we can uh, chat about this then as well. OK, um, so. You have hopefully by now a little bit of feel of what is <laughs> ahead of you, what we are going to do. Also a little bit of the formal structure when the coursework is coming out, what you're supposed to do for your coursework. In the next session, I would like to give you a little bit like why social psychology? Why do we as social psychologists think that the social element of our psyche, of our mind is so important? Why is it so fundamental if we want to understand humans that we understand the social dimension of our uh, mind and thereafter we would talk a little bit about how this module works okay we would talk about the timelines what we do in the seminars where you can find stuff on moodle and so forth i will introduce uh, yasmin and connie and they will introduce themselves as well so that at the end of the session you will leave and know what is ahead of you and there's no real uncertainty left about uh, what you need to do and i hope this sounds fine Okay, so let me kind of, oh, the office hours thereafter, um, if you have any other questions. Now I said um, a little bit like, okay, uh, it's really important to understand another person by trying to figure out who they are. And um, so I want to tell you shortly, I don't really like talking about myself too much. Uh, I like talking, but not about myself. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I just want to give you a little bit of feel of who I am and what I do, and maybe why I'm kind of uh, well suited to be your social psychology lecturer. Um, so if you were to ask me, I think social psychologists, we will talk about this next week, have this technique where they ask him, who are you? And then it's like, okay, they ask you 20 times, who are you? I think the first answer I would give, if you would ask me, I would say, okay, I'm a father. This is like the most, has the highest priority in my life. You can see here, my son is uh, five, or here is five, he's now six, and we're climbing here on, on the right. There's my daughter. This was um, uh, uh, our Chris done during our latest Christmas vacation. So if you ask me, who am I? Then my first response would be, I'm a father. My second response would be that I am a husband. Here you can see my wife opening her Christmas presents with my son, Alistair. So these are kind of like, they're not quite relevant, but you can see, gives you a little bit more of a feeling for who I am and what is important in my life. But I'm also, I think, maybe third, maybe fourth. Uh, I would say, okay, I'm a scientist, okay? I do, and I really love, and I'm super passionate about my research. I do research on social psychology, okay? Um, and so here are some kind of ideas that can tell you a little bit about what I study. Um, I'm interested in social influence. Um, this is a paper on confirmation bias. You can also see this is done in fMRI. I'm kind of interested in connecting how the brain uh, uh, helps us to better understand some of these social uh, uh, phenomena. I started doing my PhD looking at self-regulation, something we touch on next week and touch out throughout this like how can i help 
people to better regulate their self, their behavior, in order to achieve the goals they would like to achieve. Um, I think this becomes much more important in my third year elective on applied social psychology, trying to kind of use the tools social psychology has to offer in order to change it. Uh, I also am really interested in uh, belief updating, bias belief updating, something that uh, people are very interested, interested uh, uh, in the applied sciences, something like clinical psychology, um, where people really uh, see that as one of the factors that impacts uh, depression and anxiety. So I'm very much interested in that. We talk a little bit about this next week. Um, and I'm also kind of like, uh, or I'm really, really passionate and interested in research on pro-social behavior. Okay, and we will talk about my research in that area when we talk about pro social behavior in week 10. Okay, so I think I kind of hope that I can convince you that I have some expert status. The things I say uh, are somewhat, um, uh, uh, I hope they're not just plausible, but I hope that uh, this gives you a little bit of confidence that the things I talk about might be true and might apply. Um, I'm also, this is really not super like relevant right now. I also on Wednesdays, you get an email from me about employability. This is also something I do. Uh, some of you might have seen me during the employability talks. We will have again employability talks this week, uh, this semester events, uh, how you learn, how you can take your career to a next level. And also on this starts, and this is relevant to you guys, uh, if you're interested in building your research experience and really building a foundation for having a great career, then you will hear from me on Friday because I run the Psychology Research Excellence Program. And this will start for you guys uh, this semester as well. But uh, this, I leave that to my email on Friday. Um, okay. Let's do a little bit like 15 minutes of science and then or 10 minutes of science and then we do 10 minutes of organization and then our time is already up. Um, so why social psychology? Why should you as a person like let's say you're clinical psycho or you're interested in clinical psychology or educational psychology or forensic psychology or counseling or anything like that? Why should you care about social psychology, right? Social psychology is a, a foundational uh, science, so it's not an applied science, right? We're kind of interested in understanding how the social dimension impacts mind and behavior, right? But why should you care? And why do we think it is so important to look at that? One way to kind of explain this is often that I explain uh, by comparing Neanderthals with Homo sapiens. So if we compare us to the Neanderthals, then we might think like, why did they about 20,000, I think it's 20,000 to 30,000 years, why did they all die out and we are still alive? What makes us special, right? So if we would do this lecture in a, a lecture hall and we would have a little bit more time, I would ask you, right? I was like, what do you think? What makes us special? Why did we survive um, and the Neanderthals did not survive. Some people think that we killed off all the Neanderthals. Others think that the Neanderthals were not as able to adapt to climate change and hence uh, they died off. So what makes us either the more fearsome warrior or maybe the, the ones that are better in kind of adapting to an ever-changing environment? I think some things people then suggest this like, okay, Maybe we were stronger, maybe we were more intelligent, or maybe we we're just healthier. Okay. But if you look at the artifacts, it actually seems like that at the time the Neanderthals died out, that it was more like something with they were at least equal to our intelligence. I think the first, for instance, music instrument, the first um uh, signs of culture are part of the Neanderthals, not of us. It seems like we stole tools and uh, music and other things from the Neanderthals. They were clearly stronger than us. And if you look at how healthy they were, it seems like that if you look at the bones, they had much more cuts. They were much more hardy and surviving things. So what? So there's this kind of like the first things we think about what make what make um, you really good and kind of, for instance, uh, conquering another clan of humans would be okay, maybe strength, maybe it's intelligence, maybe it is health, but it seems like that at least there's no clear advantage we had over the Neanderthals. But the more you we did research on that, and the more the people who do research on that, the more you can see that what we have is we have this ability, this social ability, right? It seems like what 
sets us apart from most animals, but basically any animal in the uh, animal kingdom, but also, and here more crucially to our question from Ninana thoughts, that we were able to cooperate in larger groups, right? This is the social brain hypothesis. So the idea here is that you and I have this large brain because we needed to coordinate um, large groups and to work together. So here, a very simple example you can think about, let's say there's another group of Neanderthals and we are trying to uh, conquer them. So right now we have about 175 participants in this Zoom call, right? Um, humans are about to, homo sapiens, are about to um, uh, like believe to travel in group about 150. So all of us, now we are online, but if we would be in a room, we would be able to coordinate each other. We wouldn't, uh, we would work together. We would understand what the other person is thinking and thereby we could set plans. And then just by sheer size, we could out, uh, I don't know, it's like, yeah, out warfare the Neanderthals, right? The Neanderthals individually might be stronger, smarter and healthier, but they could not compete with our sheer size and our ability to socially coordinate. So what makes you and me human is that we're social and maybe not social but kind of uber super social uh, uh being so here this is like something i just want to quickly reference social brain hypothesis by robert dunbar who is at oxford and he thinks like okay there's like one hypothesis that is basically the your brain size correlates with the size of the people that is around you why you and i have such large brains is because we need to figure out other people in order to um coordinate and coexist with them so what makes you you and me specific, unique, uh, different is our social element. And there's the first clue that if I want to understand the brain, if I want to understand the mind of a person, I have to take the social dimension uh, serious because this is basically what our brain is made to do, right? We, it can do many, many other things, but this primary uh, function seems to coordinate uh, with each other. Um, you can see that when you kind of compare uh, humans with chim chimpanzees and orangutans, right? Uh, chimpanzees and orangutans are our closest uh, uh, ancestors, our closest um, uh, relatives, right, in terms of genetic heritage. And you can see that if you don't worry about too much of, about these graphs, but if you test and compare a chimpanzee orangutan and a, uh, a human in the beginning of their life, what you can see if it's like, if it's a, a reason, reasoning that involves space quantities or causality, that the orangutans, the apes, and the humans do fairly similar. We perform fairly similar, okay? So it doesn't seem like that we are come to this with this uh, innate ability to outperform a, a, a orangutan and causal, causal reasoning. No, um, we are very fairly similar in doing these things. But once you introduce the social element, this is where really the, the kit, the human and the uh, orangutans and the chimpanzees uh, go apart. So you can see this, for instance, here really strongly on the left, right, social learning. You can see this is basically where the kids all get the social learning task and the orangutans on average and the chimpanzees do not get it at all. So we, you and I, are made uh, to be ultra social animals. Our brain is primed to kind of um, learn from others and to understand other people. Um, and this is also probably something why you and I are so interest in psychology in general, because it seems like this is a really something that's innately interesting to us, understanding the people that are around us. You can also see, so the other side, right? Why is social, if social, the social dimension to us is so important, then taking it away might be really bad. And you can see there's a lot of research really coming out, the kind of epidemic of loneliness, okay? And they seem like that basically being lonely has the same impact as smoking cigarettes, 15 cigarettes a day. It also really affects our brain. So you and I, we can't be happy, we can't thrive, we can't be healthy if we are not socially embedded, right? And it's like, there's nothing else like that, right? In, in uh, psychology that makes us so unhappy. I think we can still be healthy if we stop reasoning <laughs> or if we stop uh, thinking about causality or any of these things, right? So there's something really fundamental to the social uh, dimension. 
Um, this is one last bit kind of like, I think, uh, basically making the same point is the famous uh, paper by Daniel Kahneman and Deaton. And what they look at is basically how much money do you need to have to be happy? Um, and so uh, what you can see here on the, uh, 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 basically like the, the correlation between your annual income on the x-axis and then your happiness on the y-axis. And the key part here is to take away that at a certain amount of money, your uh, happiness completely goes flat. In this study, it was uh, around basically 80,000, that there's like, whether you have 80,000 or 160,000 or even more in this study, I think it's of 10,000s of people that didn't really make any difference on the happiness you experience. One thing, and that's why the study is famous for, but if you look at, so what did make uh, people really happy, right? You can see that's like how well they're socially influenced, which by far the biggest factors of all these high income, whether you're old or not, whether you're religious or not, whether you're married, whether you have children, whether all of that did not really matter. What matters was how well you feel socially connected. So this is kind of just to drive the point home that being social is something that we need in order to be happy. And if you uh, watch the additional video for this week, you will see you can apply that to really explain a lot of really interesting phenomenons around happiness and flourishing. Um, so in some sense, right, it's kind of like social psychology is all about social, which is a little bit, uh, of course, it is all about social, it's in the name, right? Um, but it's beyond the phenomenon, right, that we investigate. Not everything we will investigate is about social behavior, but it's about the impact that others have on our beliefs, on our happiness, or the connections we feel with others, right? Um, so this is a formal definition of uh, social psychology. Psychology, as uh, some of you might know, especially like I'm looking at Yasmin, she's my PhD student. No, I hate definitions. I don't really care about definitions. But here it's kind of good to think because it's the uh, the idea of social psychology is not to study social behavior, but how the um, uh, kind of like the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of individuals, of you and me, are influenced but an actual imagined or implied presence of others, okay? It doesn't have to be even that there's a, another person in the room, how are, but how are we influenced by others? Even if we just imagine there we hear, oh, I wish my mother couldn't see this, or I wish my mother could see that, right? So this comes very natural to us. And there's kind of like two dimensions to that, and we will come back to this in the seminar this week, but we will also come back to this throughout each week, and you can see it in the case study in the additional video that is on the uh, on Moodle. Um, then we say social matters the most. I think for me as a social psychologist, I think like if I want to understand somebody's suffering, if I want to understand clinical psychology, then I know that for me, the most important aspect of that is their social function, right? If I want to kind of elevate their uh, uh, helping with their suffering, then I need to uh, uh, focus on that. That is my conviction. And that's the conviction of social psychology. Um, cognitive psychology would say something, for instance, very different. There is like, oh, a depressed person suffers from how they uh, uh, process information and i would say well this might be true but it's only you can only understand how they process information if you consider the social dimension um and so the other one is kind of like okay if i want to understand why a person believes something i need to consider it it's not just that uh, uh, for happiness social is important but any belief you have um, is influenced by the others in systematic ways and we want to try to understand that Okay, so that is like in some ways what social psychology is about. It's not just social behavior. It's not just, oh, I, I, am I nice or nasty to you, but it's much more. Okay, um, I'm somewhat surprised that I'm still on time to do this. Okay, let me just quickly walk you through the kind of structure of this module so that you know, you know now, okay, these are the syllabus, you know a little bit what social psychology is. I hope I could motivate you to kind of say like, oh, this might be really interesting, helpful, whatever you want to do later in your life with your psychology degree. Um, so we, this is like the weekly structure. 
I just want to talk a little bit about this and how this is uh, relevant to you. We have obviously a lecture on Monday. Uh, you're uh, just experience it. Um, once it's uh, kind of ready to be uploaded, I will uh, upload the recording. So on Monday, the recording will also be available. Um, thereafter, after the lecture, we immediately have the office hour that was a wish uh, you guys had to kind of coordinate us better. If you have any questions, content or otherwise, you feel like Andreas might have an answer, please just stay and you can ask me this question in just as we would kind of hang a little bit around the lecture hall if we would do this in person um, on tuesdays um, i release ladies on tuesdays this is my suggestion two or three videos additional videos to watch okay and this is really so this is um it includes kind of like a case study you can see this in ours like where it's like okay here's a question how can social psychology help us answer this okay and the idea is like this is essential okay it is as if this would be in a lecture i assume that you know this content if you uh kind of write your coursework if you write your report i assume that you have been taught that the videos to watch the videos these are i think this time it's like about 40 minutes i watch uh everything double speed there's a recent study coming out that if you watch everything on double speed it does not impair uh your learning so you can watch it on double speed uh and uh this is like 20 minutes of work um, on Wednesday and Thursday, I recommend that you uh, dedicate an hour of reading. I think an hour of reading is enough. Uh, you have to also add other modules. In, I mean, you can do this in different ways, right? Um, you're your own boss, but these are my recommendations. And we'll talk about reading in a second. Um, and then on Friday, we have the seminars, okay? And we talk about the seminars uh, a little bit, what will is going to happen in these seminars. Um, Speaking of seminars, I think let me kind of stop sharing and introduce uh, Connie and uh, Yasmin, and then maybe I could highlight you guys um, at Spotlight and then add another. Okay, and maybe Yasmin and Connie, you can introduce yourself, and then I will talk a little bit about um, uh, the seminars and what's going to happen in these seminars, okay? Yasmin, maybe you start. Hello, um, I'm Yasmin and I'm Andreas's PhD student. I'm in halfway through my second year and I am I did the Bachelors of Psychology here as well. And then I did a Master's in Social Cognition and now I'm doing my PhD. My uh, research is on how people take on information depending on how it's delivered to them. Um, and whether there are individual differences that uh, affect that and, you know, that kind of realm. Um, yeah, I'll be taking the morning sessions of, of the seminars. I don't know if there's anything else you want me to introduce, but that's me. Anything personal you would be willing to share? Um, personally, What's I- What's the Netflix show you're watching currently? Oh, at the moment I'm watching I'm actually catching up on all the Marvel and Star Wars series things, being a okay. full nerd, watching Boba Fett. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so if you want to talk social psychology or Marvel, then uh, chat with Yasmin. Okay, yeah. Connie, what are you watching currently? Oh, wow. I love watching, I don't know, Sherlock Holmes lately. Okay. Yeah, I don't know, kind of nerdy, but I love it. All right, but tell us a little bit more about you. Um, yes. Uh, so as you now know, I will be with the groups that are having the uh, afternoon sessions on Fridays. Um, my background is a little bit different than Yasmin's. Um, my background actually is on engineering. I used to work with technology, with technology, with technological developments. And actually, I came very interested about uh, behavioral sciences and psychology because I wanted to understand how humans interact with technology, specifically artificial intelligence. I don't know if you know anything about that, but if you if you want to talk to me about that, uh, I'm I'm all ears. And actually, I focus uh, my research on that, and that's what we have been doing with Andreas since I did my masters at City. So. Yeah, I don't know. 
Yes, what that else, sounds then? great. I think it's like it's worth mentioning that we're all in the same lab and we do research together, social psychologically relevant research together. Uh, so there will be a, a kind of tight connection between the three of us. We uh, know and like each other and occasionally even talk to each other. Um, so uh, uh, I think that's nice. Thank you, Yasmin and Connie for stopping by. Um, let me kind of maybe use this and talk uh, a little bit for one minute about what will happen in the seminars. I think the key idea about the seminars is that they provide some additional value to you. So there, we will not just simply repeat what has been said in the lectures. There was, this is not a revision session. Obviously, if you have any questions, you feel like, oh, I can't understand uh, this or that part, then you can ask uh, Connie and Yasmin and they might help you. And if not, they can refer to me and I can help you or you can come to the office hour. But the primary purpose of the seminars is to help you use kind of the content we have and then apply it in a similar way we would do it in the coursework. So it's a coursework preparation application um, uh, process. One bit will always be content focused, okay? So it's like the content of the week, we're trying to apply it and thereby better understand it. The other bit is kind of uh, things around the coursework itself. Right. Um, I think we will talk in a second bit of the module after the reading week. We will talk a little bit more nitty gritty details about writing and so forth. When you're in the writing process, how can you structure writing? But we will uh, mark other like uh, last year's coursework and kind of look at it. What do students do well? What not? What are things people uh, struggled last year with? How you can overcome that? How you do not make the same mistakes um, and so forth. Like, like how can you find easy, quickly, uh, good literature or uh, research and so forth. So it would be always kind of like a, a little bit of like we will start with a little quick quiz that you will do as a group. And then we will have some application and some kind of uh, bits and pieces about coursework. And uh, uh, since I'm doing this a little bit now uh, for, for a while, so I know what you guys will struggle with. I know what is difficult and I wanna use that knowledge in order to prepare you. So I think for us, it's really important that you, that you don't think there's just like a passive uh, repetition that's happening in these seminars, but it's also we are trying to kind of do that gives you a good reason and good value why you should come in, right? So you're not feel like, oh, I could have, Wow. Yeah. Um, so that's really like what we are trying to do. And I hope we can achieve that. One thing while I kind of like um, uh, at this, uh, I just like as the last thing today, what I want to do, oh no, I'm lost you guys. Uh, what I want to do is show you a little bit around on um, our Moodle page. I think we have like two minutes. If you bear with me, I'm a little a uh, tiny bit over time, but if you look at our Moodle page here, then I can talk a little bit about kind of like the last things I want to talk about. In the top here, you see the reading list, okay? If you click on a reading list, what you can see is, this is the book here, Social Psychology, there's a textbook. I personally hate textbooks. I think textbooks are terrible. I think they really squeeze all the joy of out of everything of of social psychology you really just like oh my god i thought this was interesting but i think you should think about and i give you recommendations for chapters where you can do bits and pieces right that will give you a better understanding so if you look in the weekly plan of um the if you kind of go down here and you kind of look at for our week today you have a weekly plan and here i have some recommendations what to look up for in the first week what you can read okay i will and strongly encourage you each week to focus more on um reading uh, at least bits and pieces of the research articles that I give you, because your understanding will accelerate 10 times more the more you read uh, uh, research articles. I know you guys feel a little hesitant, most of you, some of you feel hesitant about it, but it's just like what I'm trying to get you. Uh, so there will always be a little bit of a chapter, but the, most of the time it's like, read this research article instead, read this review instead, because why do I hate social psychology textbooks? It's also they're often outdated and they don't talk about the real problems or these like people who are not real experts that talk about these subjects. And I think we should just have uh, read what the world leading experts um, suggest and not what some kind of textbook author says who, uh, yes, 
I think we can discuss why people talk uh, or write textbooks at different time. So there's here, you see the weekly plan. If you click on it, it gives you the ideas what's happening, what you're supposed to do. Uh, you have the slides and the recording for the lecture. Obviously the recording is not there because we're just recording, but this is where it will be underneath. Then there are the additional videos to watch. Here are the slides for the additional videos and here are the two additional videos. If you're kind of like, hey, you know what? Uh, I wanna learn more, some things are really interesting. You can click on deep dive. Often while I research and refresh my understanding, I find really interesting things. Um, I think uh, sometimes YouTube videos, sometimes things that I recommend to read to kind of really deepen it. Here's the materials for seminars. You can see last year I had to do this online. I had to do Zoom groups online. And this is the recording of that. So we will talk about the marshmallow. You can't see that right now because it's hidden for, the, uh, for you guys. But this is basically where you will find the materials for the seminars. Any Thing we need to do there as well. Everything else about the seminars you will learn next week. Uh, not next week, you will learn um, uh, on Friday. Okay. So that would be it for today. Um, and I would just stop the lecture here. As I said, I will be around um, to chat with you guys if you have any questions about coursework, reading, uh, or the structure, or anything of the content. <coughs> Yes, and uh, I mean, have an amazing start to the semester. Oh, so this is a great question, actually, Okay, Do we have to prepare anything before attending the seminar? Maybe I should, before I stop recording? You don't, really. I think you, if, then we will highlight this for you, but you don't, other than all the things that are outlined, right? If you kind of have not watched, I think always come, right? Even if you have not watched anything uh, or if you have not read anything, um, but it's always helpful to come. But I mean, we assume that you're engaged with the content of the week, right? Because we will not review that content um, with you. Okay, I hope that is helpful. Let me just stop the recording and then answer the other questions. So if there I was can... another question before yes. about the videos on Moodle. I don't know if you can see it. 